How's it everyone who's watching this? This is my 48th video on the channel and today we're going to be beginning our sixth book, Proust and Signs by Gilles Deleuze. I know I say this every time, but I'm quite excited to be starting this series. I feel that this book often gets unfairly brushed aside in favour of his philosopher-based monographs, even though it outlines many of the ideas that will come to define his solo metaphysical treatises of difference of repetition and logical sense, along with his work with Poitry. From his critique of the image of thought to the early development of concepts like the body without organs, this is truly an underrated work. To give a bit of a rundown on what it's about, it explores the role of signs in Marcel Proust's infamous novel In Search of Lost Time. These signs aren't those of structuralist linguistics, however. Instead, Luz uses Proust's work to elaborate on the idea of thought as violence. Signs are what compel us to use our faculties, what force us to think in a manner of speaking. In the process of his exploration, Toulouse develops his understanding of essences, undertaking the first steps in the reversal of Platonism that eventually come to be crucial to his philosophy. Now, just before we begin, I'll have all my sources in the description below, along with page numbers for each quote I use. With that out of the way, let's get into it. Deleuze begins chapter 1 of the work, The Types of Signs, by asking what exactly In Search of Lost Time is about. For those of you who are familiar with the work, I imagine your mind would likely go towards memory, or maybe even to the Madelines that provoke it. However, in his words, What is involved is not an exposition of involuntary memory, but the narrative of an apprenticeship. More precisely, the apprenticeship of a man of letters. The search is first and foremost just that, a search or journey, one which must pass through a number of worlds before finally coming to a revelation, Proust narrator learning as he goes. For Deleuze, such an apprenticeship is necessarily concerned with signs and decoding them. As he says, there is no learner who is not simultaneously an Egyptologist of sorts. To be a carpenter, you must first become sensitive to the signs of wood, for a doctor the signs of disease, so on and so on. In this chapter, Deleuze focuses first and foremost on the hypothesis that signs like these, particularly those of worldliness, love, impressions and art, from both the unity and the plurality of Proust's masterpiece. As mentioned earlier, each of these varieties formed their own distinctive worlds, which, despite intersecting at certain points, exist mostly independently of each other and according to different sets of rules. As far as the narrator's apprenticeship goes, the first of these is that of worldly signs. This is the realm of high society and the salons, embodied in the search by the characters of Charlou, the Veuve de Rhin, and Madame de Guermont. Here, signs are more than plentiful, as Lou says, few milieu emit more. However, they are, in a sense, also empty, essentially being composed of ossified, albeit also ever-changing, social conventions and stereotype repetitions. They come to replace thought and action itself. As Deleuze says, Nothing funny is said at the Verdorans, and Madame Verdoran does not laugh. But Cotard makes a sign he is saying something funny. Madame Verdoran makes a sign that she is laughing. These signs don't simply represent something, no. Rather, they stand in for things and claim to be their equivalent in meaning. However, this emptiness doesn't mean that a journey through the many worlds of signs can ignore them. On the contrary, Deleuze argues, it's impossible for an apprenticeship to be completed without passing via worldliness first. This is because, on the one hand, this world offers a masterclass in the circulation and evolution of signs. More than simply being stratified according to classes, be them bourgeois or aristocratic, they are, perhaps more fundamentally, differentiated according to what Deleuze calls families of mind. Attached to endlessly fluctuating social conventions and norms, he describes them as constantly giving way to new signs, which precipitate out and change the implicit laws of a world in which they are engendered. Thus the apprentice's task is to understand why someone is received in a certain world, why someone ceases to be, what signs do the worlds obey, which signs are legislators and which high priests. On the other hand, he argues, they also contain a kind of sterile splendour that can be found nowhere else. In their emptiness, worldly signs have a ritualistic perfection, one capable of inducing feelings of nervous exaltation when encountered. It's with this that he turns his attention to the second world that Proust's narrator encounters, that of amorous signs. To love, our author says, is to individualise someone by the signs they emit. We become sensitive to them, a process of silent interpretation. However, this isn't a peaceful process in the slightest. There's always a hidden kind of violence involved. The beloved, as a sign, forces us to think, drives us to try and explicate all the hidden possible worlds that lie beneath the surface. However, there's a contradiction that lies at the heart of these signs. They conceal just as much as they reveal. As Deleuze so eloquently puts it, 
We cannot interpret the signs of a loved person without proceeding into worlds that have not waited for us in order to take form, that form themselves with other persons and in which we are at first only an object amongst the rest. Every action expressed by the loved signs necessarily stems from something that excludes us. Caresses that were once linked to other lovers, signs of preference that could have been connected to someone else, and so on and so on. In this way, they invoke jealousy, even though they simultaneously are what should be keeping us from experiencing it. At this point, Toulouse introduces two laws of Proustian love, one subjective, the other objective. The first states that jealousy runs deeper than love, whilst the second states that heterosexual loves are less profound than homosexual ones. To explain the first, everything comes back to the contradiction from earlier. Jealousy, anguish and so on all form of the finality of love, insofar as love is necessarily built upon deception. Yet Deleuze is quick to stress that this deception is not based on some ill will on the part of a beloved. Instead, amorous signs simply and necessarily can never completely contain the lover. No matter what, there is a point of absolute exclusion, where every sign from a female beloved converges, which represents the very essence of a so-called feminine possibility. Something Deleuze, referencing a volume from In Search of Lost Time, calls the world of Gamora. It's from here that jealousy emanates, incarnated in the idea of female homosexuality, an experience the straight male lover can never truly explicate. However, this is paired with another world, that of Saddam, which implicates every one of those lovers under male homosexuality. It's with this that we get to the objective law of Proustian love. Saddam and Gomorrah act as the two series that underlie jealousy, and, when necessary consequence, all of heterosexual love. In a way, Toulouse's reading of Proustia is reminiscent of Lacan's infamous claim that there exists no relationship between the sexes. To explain this a bit more clearly, I think a small detour through Antiedipus might be helpful. In Proust and Signs, Deleuze talks about the series as coexisting, yet never converging, in what he terms the original hermaphrodite. With Quattery, he expands on this idea by stating, We are statistically or molarly heterosexual, but personally homosexual, without knowing it or being fully aware of it. And finally, we are transsexual in an elemental molecular sense. Unlike what Judith Butler describes as Freud's two heterosexualities, Deleuze with Guattari suggests the existence of a pair of homosexualities. Unrelated to Jennifer for the most part, a straight person is transsexual in the sense of traversing the series of Saddam to that of Gomorrah, or vice versa. However, that's getting a bit ahead of ourselves. To turn back to Proust and Signs, Deleuze writes, Heterosexual loves are merely the appearance that covers the destination of each sex, concealing the cursed depth where everything is elaborated. For Deleuze's Proust, the entirety of love emanates from Saddam and Gomorrah, and the exclusions they signify. As such in heterosexual love, jealousy always runs deeper in the sense that it will always be impossible to go far enough, to truly understand the beloved, even in spite of the forceful nature of the thoughts produced by amorous signs. On this rather somber note, we get to the third world of a search, that of sensuous signs. Here the emotion associated with their experience is not one of anguish, like in the case of the signs of love, nor exaltation, like with the signs of worldliness, but rather a strange kind of joy. Moreover, what must be explicated is not the object that emits the sign itself, but rather something distinct or other to it. We can see this in probably the most famous scene of the search, where the narrator eats a madeleine and is brought back through time to his childhood home of Combray. However, rather than Combray as it actually existed, he experiences it in its essence, a kind of virtual form that Deleuze describes in Difference and Repetition, like so. Combre reappears, not as it was, or as it could be, but in a splendor which was never lived, like a pure past which finally reveals its irreducibility to the two presents which it telescopes together. However, as he goes on to relate, Proust saw the Madeleine as a failure, pointing towards another, ultimate stage of interpretation. In Deleuze's reading, sensuous signs still fall short of being truly adequate signs. The reason why lies in their materiality. They are unable to capture the true ideal eternity of Combray, Venice, Balbec, or any other of the many examples he lists from the search. This is firmly contrasted with the final world of a narrator's apprenticeship, where we find art signs, the material and ideal. It's only in them that we can find essence with a capital E, allowing us to colour all the other varieties with aesthetic meaning and, to borrow directly from the text, imbue what's still opaque in them. This transformation is particularly evident in sensuous signs, 
since it reveals the ideal content that was hiding in them all along. However, ending the chapter, Clues doesn't spend much time on what these signs look like, simply stating, We have not yet defined them. We ask only the reader's concurrence that Proust's problem is the problem of signs in general, and that the signs constitute different worlds. It's with this that we get to the second chapter of Proust and Signs, Signs and Truth. Here, as the title suggests, Clues' focus falls squarely on truth, time, and their role in the four worlds of apprenticeship. However, before we get there, he says we first need to understand what exactly searching for truth means in the context of Proust's search. To begin with, who undertakes the journey in the first place? For Proust, the answer really isn't the philosopher or the love of wisdom. In fact, he goes as far as to say that there is no such thing as a natural desire or will for truth. This is because, to borrow from difference of repetition once again, Thought is primarily trespass and violence, the enemy, and nothing presupposes philosophy. Everything begins with misosophy. To give some context, misosophy here refers to a hatred of wisdom. Science disrupts the peace and makes us think. We have no choice in the matter, the violence forcing us into action. Closely linked to this is the development of those signs, which thus have a temporal dimension, through which they are explicated. Time itself is plural, in the sense that it unravels in a number of distinct ways, something explored in the final systemization Proust undertakes in the final volume of the search. Time regained. Using it, Deleuze explains that each type of sign has a privileged line of time that defines it. For example, time wasted characterizes worldly signs, time lost is linked to love signs, and so on and so on. However, this isn't to say that they only work in one register. He's careful to stress that just because they aren't as important, other temporal structures don't also implicate signs outside their specific focus. To borrow from his own words, There is also the pluralism that multiplies the combinations. Each kind of sign participates in several lines of time. Each line of time mingles several kinds of signs. Following the title of the book he's analyzing, Deleuze first turns his attention towards lost time, and the signs that make us aware of it and the changes it brings, along with the annihilation of what was. After an appropriate apprenticeship in signs, he says, the role of lost time becomes omnipresent. For example, worldly signs are, like we went over earlier, always change and alteration. Fashions come and fashions go. In the search, we see this in the Dreyfus affair, then World War I, then finally in time itself, personified, each time revealing worldliness to be an effect of what's lost. As Deleuze himself states, Proust does not in the least conceive of change as a Bergsonian duration, but as defection, a race to the grave. This is no more apparent than in Love Signs, which he describes as anticipating both their alteration and their annihilation. They carry within them jealousy and the twin series of Sodom and Gomorrah, that provoke it, hence constantly acting out their own dissolution. We can see an example of this in the narrator's love for the character of Albertine, where, in fear of her leaving, he feigns taking leave himself, inadvertently repeating the death of their love in advance. Moving on to sensuous signs, last time is implicated once again. To lose this example from Proust concerns the narrator unbuttoning his spoots, a sign much like that of Madeleine, being struck by a memory of his grandmother, just like Virgil Combray. In that moment, he feels a kind of strange ambivalence. The joy of unraveling an impression turns into pain as he finally completely realizes she's dead, tears streaming from his eyes. Along with this lost time, however, there's also time wasted, which defines worldly signs first of all, yet also extends to those of love and impressions. To borrow Deleuze's words once again, For it is not reasonable to go into the world, to be in love with mediocre women, nor even to make so many efforts in front of a hawthorn tree. However, this is only true at the beginning. Once one goes through the apprenticeship of signs, everything changes. There are certain truths that exist in wasted time. As Deleuze puts it, only so much can be found through writing a great work of literature or from befriending those who are intelligent and profound. We have to be able to reach the truth through other means before such things have any value. These means, Deleuze says, are one and the same as signs. Just because someone isn't as smart as Einstein or what have you, doesn't mean that they aren't rich in signs. In fact, it goes as far as to say that those who are mediocre essentially compensate with them. Wasted time is thus no less important than lost time, serving an essential purpose for the apprenticeship. At the end of the day, as he says, We never know how someone learns, but whatever the way, it is always by the intermediary of signs, by wasting time, and not by the assimilation of some objective content. Nevertheless, just wasting time is pointless. 
there has to be something to extract its truths in lost time, as Proust describes under the name of intelligence. However, this never precedes signs, underlying once against the violence of thought, Deleuze says they must first be forced to use the faculty. Intelligence is always deployed after the fact. It works by coming to terms with signs of worldliness and love, making us understand that the first corresponds to laws and the second to repetitions. For Deleuze, it's true that worldly signs are frivolous, but they also teach us that gestures, greetings, and so on are to be interpreted. Likewise, love signs, painful may they be, push us to seek the truth. For him and his Proust, it's the just lover who searches, not the philosopher in the literal sense of a lover of wisdom for wisdom's sake. Ending the chapter, Deleuze writes, Time wasted, lost time, but also time regained, recovered time. To each kind of sign, there doubtless corresponds a privileged line of time. Giving an overview of the structure of time in each world, worldly signs are first and foremost those of time wasted. Love signs are those of time lost, and art signs, time regained. In the schema, sensuous signs act as a means to regain that time, having a temporal relationship with art signs similar to that of its essence. With all this in mind, Toulouse stresses once again that there isn't any either-or with the different strands of time. They all mix together in the diverse circles of signs that make up in search of lost time. Now, this concludes the first two chapters from Gilles Deleuze's book, Proust and Signs, understanding some of the basic characteristics of the four worlds that the narrator of the search passes through during his apprenticeship. I truly hope you enjoyed or learned something, and if you feel I got anything wrong or wasn't as clear as I could have been, please do feel free to let me know in the comments so I can do better. Next time, we'll most likely be looking at the paper notes on some schizoid mechanisms by psychoanalyst Melanie Klein. Until then, bye!